Elden Ring um, is right is the first, as far as I can tell, as far as I remember. Uh, well, what am I saying? I know, I know, it's the first uh, from Soft or Miyazaki game that is that's open world. And before we start, I was just thinking about how cool it is to have, as opposed to the other games where you're literally always in the dungeon, right? Even if you're in Bloodborne and you're in Yarnum, uh, and it's outside. So narratively, it's not a dungeon design wise. It's a dungeon. Um, it's corridors with monsters, traps, items, whatever. Right. Um, this is a genuine, not dungeon, right? This is the wilderness, right? To use the term that original D and D would have used. Uh, so I wanted to quickly just bring that up because I think it's pretty cool and talk a little bit about that. So I'm going to show you now. Uh, those are those are our notes we've got going on. So this is the third. This is basically the original D and D uh, Dungeons and Dragons Edition Zero. It could be called, or it's usually called original D and D. This is the that version of the Dungeon Master's Guide, which was called the Underworld and Wilderness Adventures. And that's what they're actually called in original D&D. Dungeons are called Underworld, and non-Underworld is called Wilderness. So if you look, the first rules are... Um, first about 10 pages or so about how to design dungeons, how dungeons work, how to put treasure in them, blah, blah, blah. And, you know, there's also also the monster book that tells you how to do it, how to put or that gives you the stats for the monsters rather. Um, and then there's uh, the wilderness, which actually, interestingly, even though the game is meant to take place in the dungeon, mostly takes up more of the actual book, which is, you know, it's not that long. We're talking in the 70s, the zero edition D&D, we're talking small like Mimeo booklets way before high production value of, you know, D&D books today or even the ones that would come out later in the in the 80s. In the 70s we're talking very DIY low budget 70s Mimeo stuff. Um and what it says to use is actually the rules, right? Um you know, the dungeons basically take place in your in your mind, theater of the mind style and you, uh, the players, right? The dungeon master, or, or uh, it's interesting. Also, that term was not there yet in zero edition. In zero edition, uh, it was called the referee, which I actually kind of like. The referee, it's kind of a cool, cool name for it. But um, the referee is the person who, um, who uh, is designing these dungeons and has has a map of a of a hidden dungeon um but the players as they're listening have their own graph paper with which they are um designing or or mapping out the dungeon as they play and i think that's cool to keep in mind because you know for this is a central part of what it meant to play DD originally is to be paying sort of careful attention to the the environments as experienced in the theater of the mind um and that that mapping and making a map which is just much more immersive i think than having a map sitting on a board like it became in later editions like third and fourth edition especially of moving pieces around but they did suggest a board for the wilderness but you know the game was just the booklets So they didn't have a board, obviously, but they told you to buy this game, Outdoor Survival, um, which I I just for historical sake, I want to try playing a game of. But uh, they told you to buy this guide, this game rather, and use the board. So if you notice, there's hexes, right, which is where the hex crawl comes from. And the idea being that uh, this would be your overworld map or your wilderness map um, and you could move each space. Um, I can't remember what the rules say in here about how long the spaces are, the hexes are rather, but you know, you could do it like 
it takes one day to travel one hex or you could say it's like five miles or 10 miles or whatever right and you move around um, the referee would be rolling uh, chances for random encounters so that's obviously where in in video games at least of the time it turns into just the, the game is secretly secretly rolling a number of whether or not you're going to run into an enemy or whatever but you know there's this big world that you can move around in and you might want to do that for a number of reasons right they talk about running into a castle um and if you're going to have to fight the people in the castle or not and this is also where alignment plays in a little bit like if you're both lawful then the castle might welcome you in but if you're chaotic and the castle is lawful they might fight you or vice versa but you could go around and and get money to even to build your own stronghold it has rules which is interesting because i don't think in the modern version of D people think about it as much but in the original there was very much this thing like you want to get here and you want to build your own castle you want to get enough money to build your own settlement which you can come and bring your treasure back to when you get in, which I think is pretty cool. And there's also a lot about like, it also is interesting. It has rules for like, which is the major thing. It has rules for, uh, for large scale war, which is, you know, the, the origins of D and D are in war gaming. And in fact, in these, I thought it was really interesting when I was just reading these not too long ago, the original D&D refers to itself as a war game and its players as war gamers, right? It, it hadn't developed its own genre at that point to be referred to as something else. Um, and that's really what this is, right? It's a, it's a simulation. Uh, and it's d and is all about this simulation of something that might happen. But this is, the, this is a crucial part of D&D is going to the world and finding these dungeons that are you know, in pockets all over the world that you might go into and you might have adventures in there. Now, of course, um, and you know, here's a here's a recreation in like a hex version that you can use of the outdoor survival board. And of course, there are plenty of video game analogies that are coming out in the 80s since so many of 80s video games are kind of explicitly inspired by D&D. Uh, and of course, here's one of the ones that first comes to mind when I think about this. Uh, Zelda, right? The original Zelda, right? Where's the? Where do you start? It's uh, right here, right? Yeah, because you go in there, the old guy, and get the sword. Um, you're in this overworld. You could think of each screen as one of the hexes, and of course, it's a square, not a hex. But um, that's you know hardware limitations. Um, and you can go around and you can kill enemies to get money. You can find a sword in here. You can go and buy stuff. Um, and you also you find these dungeons and you can go into the dungeons. It's explicitly a video gamified version of what's being described in original D&D. Um, now, I think that's interesting in and of itself. But why am I, uh, why am I saying this? Uh, on the Elden Ring stream, because I think that's what's cool about Elden Ring. So far, every uh, Miyazaki game, you're in the dungeon already, and there's no way out of the dungeon. You know, and it might be in like, um, I mean, either you're in Demon Souls where you're just in the home base, there is no overworld, and from the home base, you teleport directly to the dungeons, or you're, you know, something like in Bloodborne, like, there are the different dungeons, and you can teleport the, to them from the home base, but you also find them in the world, right? Elden Ring is the first time that we have this aspect, that we're in the wilderness, which is cool not only because, you know, you can go around and find the dungeons in the world, but also you get this aspect, which was an important aspect of D&D, &D, and of course an important aspect of, you know, playing dragon quest or final fantasy or whatever and walking around in, in the in the kind of most boring version of it just walking around fighting uh random encounters over and over and over until you're a sufficient level that you're ready to go fight garland in the dungeon or whatever um 
but we but you get we're gonna get that gameplay for the first time in a Miyazaki game. We're gonna get um, this kind of you know go go explore the overworld, get strong in there, and then go to the dungeon when you're ready. So I think that's really cool. And also in light of that, what I'm gonna do on my first today. I mean, it's still a lore run, but I realized as I was playing yesterday, because it does have this structure, it's not going to be quite the same to do the lore run for this game as it was for Bloodborne or whatever, uh, or Dark Souls or Demon Souls or even Sekiro. Because that you can go step by step, map out the dungeon, right? Even if, if if you're watching a good run on YouTube or... You're listening to like the Bonfire Side Chat podcast or whatever. There, that's actually a version which I'm. This is occurring to me now, which is cool. That's a version of the old school '80s uh, players mapping out on graph paper the dungeon as they play. Right, you're mapping it out in your head and having a sense of the map. Because the dungeon is constrained, narrow corridors and rooms, so you can have this memorized in your head. You can't. That's not. That's precisely not what the open world is. I mean, I mean, you have this map in that case, and you have the map in Elden Ring too. But uh, you're not like memorize. You might memorize like important locations. What is the whole point? The hex is an abstract of a larger location. You you have important waypoints that you remember, but you don't have every, you know, inch of the land scoured and memorized. So so to play this right now, what I'm going to do is I think today, I mean, we'll see. I mean, I'm just obviously not going to make any rules for myself. I'll just do what I want to do while I'm playing. But what's going to happen is I'm not going to go into... A dungeon I don't think today I just want to walk around the open world and just find stuff and explore and get a sense of the land was it the the lands between is that what it's called the fog whatever I want to just walk around and see what I find there and see what's going on so and so also it'll be good since you know yesterday and sometimes when I'm playing I, I go obnoxiously slowly and I'll go a little not quite as slow today because the overworld, you know, you don't, it means you don't have to look at every single thing. You can kind of walk around and see what's going on and have a good time. So anyway, I'm pretty excited about this. I think it's cool. And that's just a little background that I was thinking about today that I think is really cool about Elden Ring. And one reason I'm really excited about it. 